Hey, welcome, and uh, thank you for joining me today. I, uh, I am not Dr. Drew Pinsky. I'm Kelly Victory f- filling in for uh, Dr. Drew, who's off traveling today and not available. Um, really happy that we're actually broadcasting. If anyone was following uh, my Twitter feed earlier, we were on sort of on hold because there was a uh, some severe weather uh, in Caleb's neck of the woods, and we weren't entirely sure that uh, we were not going to get knocked out by our hurricane and subsequent okay. power outage. Uh, any of you who were on last week, uh, you are well aware of Caleb's remarkable technical uh, capabilities. However, we had a lot of technical issues last week with a total shutdown of the sound system, uh, and Caleb managed to get it back on the rails in time to do the show with Ed Dowd. So uh, thank you again for that, Caleb, and we'll keep our fingers crossed that the uh, that the weather gods will work in our favor. Uh, I'm super excited about today's show. I've got Ivor Cummins, um, who many of you probably know as the Fat Emperor, uh, a triple entendre, by the way, uh, joining us today. Uh, He has got some great insight into not only the usual stuff that we talk about, important stuff, by the way, including things like increases in cancer rates and the debacle of uh, the COVID pandemic response in the first place. But I think more interestingly, um, he's got a far more broad uh, look at what's going on. We call sort of what's happening with the global cabal, the elitists, the, uh, what's the connection between the World Economic Forum and the WHO and the Gates Foundation and powers that be within our own country and really what is happening here, what we've been witnessing. Everybody kind of knows deep down even if you believed in wearing masks or you believed in these vaccines or you believed that COVID uh, was as deadly as they said, even if you believed all that, at this point, as I sit here today, April 2024, I think the average person knows something isn't right. I mean, something does not make sense anymore. Others of us are saying, oh my, you know, the world's burning, the world's on fire. But uh, everybody, I think, has got the sense that something is awry. And um, I think that Ivor has an interesting perspective on it. We're going to talk a lot about that. If we have time, we're also going to get into one of my um, pet interests with him, which is about nutrition and the food source and uh, what's being, you know, really how we are being made sick so that they can then provide us the cure for the sickness that they created. Uh, It's very circular. Anyway, so we're going to be back in just a minute with Ivor Cummins uh, and get into the weeds with him on the global cabal. Our laws as it pertain to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous I'm a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Let's talk about aging because everyone wants to know how to slow it down. For almost a decade, I've been taking a healthy aging supplement called True Niagen. This supplement boosts NAD. That's something that cells can't live without. It's done with a patented form of nicotinamide riboside called NR or Niagen. It's more efficient and more scientifically reviewed than NMN or other NAD boosters. True Niagen is truly the best way to boost NAD levels. And it's made by Chromadex. They're the gold standard in the NAD space. Dr. Charles Brenner, the scientist who discovered the NAD boosting potential of NR, explains. And the center of the metabolism that allows the conversion of food into energy is NAD coenzymes. And NAD gets disturbed um, in the aging process. And as we're exposed to conditions of metabolic stress, Mm. niagen, which is the... um, form of, of NR that was developed by Chromadex is the, is the best and the only fully legal form of NR. And this is really the gold standard for NAD boosting uh, vitamins. I love this product. I urge you to try it. Go to drdrew.com slash true for 20% off your order. 
That is drdrew.com slash trueniagen, T-R-U-N-I-A-G-E-N, and enter Dr. Drew at checkout, D-R-D-R-E-W, enter it at the checkout for 20% off. Welcome back. Uh, as I said, I'm thrilled today to be uh, joined by Ivor Commons, the fat emperor, uh, who is coming to us from across the pond in Ireland. Um, Ivor, many of you may not know, is actually a biochemical engineer by training. He spent 25 years in the corporate world, leading huge uh, worldwide teams in uh, complex problem solving issues. Uh, starting more than a decade ago, he became interested in and really delved into um, the root causes of chronic disease, something that I'm very, very interested in, uh, specifically things like obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular uh, disease, and then really looking at the nutritional um, sort of causes and fixes uh, of those disease processes. In my newest position now uh, with the wellness company, we are certainly focused on that as well. It's really about wellness and eradicating or reversing this tsunami we have right now of chronic disease. Um, we are at a time when uh, it, we are being crushed by that. And, you know, 50% of Americans have some really severe chronic disease and 80% have a chronic disease of some sort. So hopefully if we have time, we'll get into that. Um, since 2020, uh, like yours truly, uh, I've always really been immersed in uh, the COVID debacle. Uh, he certainly saw some things happening that uh, didn't make sense to him from a scientific perspective. He started looking into a number of things, uh, not the least of which were the origins of the virus itself and our very flawed public health response to it. And as I intimated in my intro uh, a minute ago, he really is looking at the broader picture of what the heck is going on, what is the connection, not just with the CDC and the FDA and, and local politicians, but the broader global response to this from the WHO, the World Economic Forum, Bill and Melinda Gates, how do they play into this? What what is this all about, really? What's the end game? Uh, and so we're probably going to start with that and then work backwards. So um, let's bring Ivor in and we'll we'll get this started. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hey, great to be here again, Kelly. Thank you. I, I think um, I follow you uh, all the time on uh on Twitter, on, on X, uh, and was amused by a, a recent uh, video that you put in. We're going to play a portion of that video talking about some of these, what I, as I call them, nefarious players that are out there. But I also, I'm very serious when I say I, I have a pet interest in nutrition and in the relationship between nutrition and lifestyle and chronic disease. Uh, a, as a physician, your average physician, by the way, knows next to nothing about nutrition. It's really pathetic. Uh, they spend about 15 minutes on it in medical school, uh, and they re and they spend you know semesters on pharmaceuticals. Um, so as I tell people all the time, if, if if you have a doctor who's writing you a prescription before having an in depth conversation with you about your lifestyle, your nutrition, your exercise routines, your sleep habits, your stress uh, levels, and they're doing that before you know they aren't having that conversation before they start writing prescriptions then you don't have a doctor, you've got a drug dealer and you need to find somebody else. So uh, hopefully we can uh, get into that as well. Um, tell, before we start though, I, since I said it, I said that the fat emperor, your, uh, your whatever, you, whatever we call it, gnome de plume, uh, it is uh, a triple entendre. How did you come up with the fat emperor? All right, Kelly. Well, very briefly, I was sitting with my wife one evening and I gotten all involved in this metabolic health sphere. I'd given several lectures, put them on YouTube, etc. Uh, but it just kind of occurred to us as we were talking that, you know, the emperor for me is mainly the emperor's new clothes from Hans Christian Andersen. You know, everyone realizes the emperor is naked, but no one says anything because they're scared because they get in trouble. So that was the whole kind of research world for 50 years. 
They couldn't say, look, this cholesterol thing is grossly exaggerated. It's largely nonsense. The real problem is blood sugar and insulin resistance. You just couldn't say it. There was a consensus panel with the NIH in the 80s, and they were basically told, you're not allowed to question cholesterol. It's the primary driver of heart disease. That was essentially their words. So there was the emperor's new clothes where everyone had to keep their mouth shut. And then the emperor, for me, I'm a corporate guy. It signifies corporate power that put the thumb on the scales for many decades and funded science, nutrition science, pharmaceutical science, funded it all towards the direction of profit. And then the last or the third thing was the poor kind of fat emperor, or the person who's diabetes, who's you know metabolically very ill, and they keep eating the healthy whole grains and the heart healthy vegetable oils, <laughs> and they're literally just destroying themselves. But they're trying to follow the advice, you see. And there's something tragic about that. So that was kind of how I came up with it. Well, I, I love it. And by the way, I'm glad that Caleb put up your book, um, The Eat Eat Rich, Live Long. I just actually ordered my copy of it. It's supposed to arrive today. I have not got, but I really want I want to uh, to read your take on it. But as you said, you know, and I think um, it's apparent to anybody who's honest in healthcare that we have a um, a public that is fatter, more diabetic, more hypertensive, um, more depressed, and more insomniac than ever, despite everything that we are do have been doing, supposedly telling them and educating them in what is supposedly a healthy diet. And so uh, clearly we're doing something wrong and frankly, probably lying to people about the reality of what's healthy and what's not uh, for the profits of uh, big pharma and the biopharmaceutical complex. So we're gonna get into that, but I really wanna start the other way, talking about um, your, your insights, and I think that they are profound, um, a humorous, but also profound with regard to what the hell is going on here. Uh, it means something is not right. So I'm going to give you the floor to talk a little bit about how you came to this. And you've got a great pictogram that we're going to show as well that I want you to walk people through, but talk about how it is that you came to even looking at it this way of that this is a far more complex global phenomenon than simply our response, you know, ill-advised or not to a specific virus. It's way bigger than that. Yeah, it's vastly bigger than that. And I started off, Kelly, I'm a root cause guy. So I started off with the complex dynamics of COVID itself. So in March 2020, my wife said, oh, do we need to get masks, do you think? And I said, no. And she said, but surely, you know, they're all talking about this COVID thing. But I had seen the Diamond Princess data, and it took me a few seconds, to be quite honest, to just do the math. You had 3,700 people. It was a Petri ship. It had max spread, perfect natural experiment. And the only people who passed away were late 70s and late 80s. And the 2,200 kind of staff uh, weren't affected at all. There was nothing reported. So I did a quick map of that to the population. I said, right, really old, immunocompromised, frail people will be affected like a severe flu. And maybe a 0.15% overall mortality rate in absolute mortality, not much different than the severe flu season. Uh, and I said, that's it. And to this day, that proved to be absolutely true. <laughs> that was it. But then, of course, they did the lockdowns. Everything went crazy. I got stuck in America at a conference, had to change flights. You know, Trump shut down everything, <laughs> got home and the airport was closing in Dublin. I said, hold on a minute. The math is simple here. And for a while, I, I thought it was hysteria. So I did allow for a while that it was the precautionary principle, that they were just all getting themselves worked up in a froth and they were just making stupid mistakes. But then people began to send me, during April, World Economic Forum, Common Pass, mid-2019, the Common Pass with Bill Gates, Microsoft, and Rockefeller Foundation set up a whole thing for a universal vaccine pass, QR code, digital ID. And I just couldn't ignore it. I didn't want it to be a kind of a conspiracy but I couldn't ignore the, these facts, and more and more came in. 
So I stuck to COVID, though, mostly for six to nine months, going through the data on transmission, lockdown ineffectiveness, mask ineffectiveness. And it was like shooting rats in a barrel. The data was so obvious. But eventually, I had to switch to the geopolitics and the reality of, of the true root cause of this madness. And that really, the big break I got, because I had the WEF, the WHO, I knew was an utterly corrupt organization. I quickly found out that Bill Gates, combined with Gavi, which is also Bill Gates, put them together. They're the biggest funder by a mile. And the key thing people need to understand is, it's not just that they're the biggest funders of the WHO, but they are truly interested parties. So all the other governments give money, don't care what the WHO does, quite honestly. They just give money because it's just tax money. It's mouse click money. They don't care. But Bill Gates's money is given for a reason, and it's for power and control and profit. So, you know, I just knew, I knew most of it, but I discovered Dr. Jakob Nordengord in Sweden, and he did a PhD around 2012 and wrote a book, Rockefeller Controlling the Game. And that gives the full history and root cause of this from the 1950s, even before that, uh, right through to the World Economic Forum 2020 and COVID. And he is perfectly correct. And everything is referenced, utterly referenced. It's all published in the Rockefeller archives and the UN. So people need to understand, not only is it not a so-called conspiracy theory, but it's fully published and self-evident how we got here. I can't stress that enough. Spectacular. So before we get into this and, and start actually walking through, as I call them, you know, these nefarious evil players, and that's what they are in my mind, you said something, and I want to make sure that we get it on the record. You Here you are, you're a guy, you're, you're not a physician, you're our scientist, and you had ready access, as did everyone, to the data from the Diamond uh, Princess cruise ship, which was a perfect example. It was a great little study in itself, a little, you know, uh, it was a microcosm of the universe. You've got these 3,000 people. You could see it was right there. Yet despite that, despite that, that information was shut down. You had Neil Ferguson at the same time, uh, you know, out of London, the College of you know, London, putting out these, quote, modeling predicting that everybody's going to die. You know, we're going to have 200 bazillion people or whatever his number was, 200 million people in the United States are going to die or whatever it was. He said it was some ridiculous number that was off by orders of magnitude, highly flawed. And at the at a time, why are you, you, know, you don't rely on modeling studies when you have actually real life studies. So they deferred to flawed modeling by a mathematician rather than looking at the actual data. You know, here's actually what's happening in real life. And that should never happen. Real life data always is superior to modeling data for good reason. Um, so I just wanna get it out there that what you were seeing and obviously concluding was correct. So, you, you know, start walking us through and you, you've you got a great diagram. So you let me know when you want to bring the diagram up or if it's easier for you to just kind of talk it through. Kind of how do these disparate or apparently disparate groups connect? What's the what's the common thread between them all? Yeah, well, probably we'll get to the diagram in a moment, but uh the best thing is to go back to Nordengard's PhD in his book, mm -hmm. Rockefeller Controlling the Game, because essentially, back in the 1950s, the five sons of John D. Rockefeller, who clearly was a sociopath, you know, the robber baron, <laughs> he was obsessed with internationalism, and he was obsessed with the idea that we needed to have one world government, essentially, where the elite, like him, uh, could manage the world and and do their trade with no limits and have the little people just do whatever work he needed them to do. And he truly believed that. It, that's just the way he was. Mm -hmm. And he taught his sons well. So his five sons in the 1950s, they set up the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and they basically embarked on delivering world government. And they stated that themselves. They said, we cannot avoid the responsibility that has been given to us, I guess, by the universe. And this is how they think. 
uh, that we need to shape a new world order in all its aspects, political, spiritual, financial, uh, etc. I mean, they wrote it all down in the Brothers Fund initiation. It's all published. So they said what they were doing. And after 70 years, they're, they're well on their way to getting it. They also knew that they would not get it within their lifetime. And they didn't have a problem with that. They knew it would take like a half century, maybe a century. And that didn't bother them. They're not like ordinary people who focus on things next week, next month, maybe next year, maybe 10 years. They focus on things that will, will come to fruition long after their death. But their sons and their children will take over the dynasty. So they're long gamers in an extreme way. But to give an example, they identified in the 1950s climate disaster as an opportunity. So that was before there was any scientists in the room. So for the next 50, 60, 70 years, through myriad organizations and funding activist groups, they got us to a stage where 90% of the climate scientists agree there's a catastrophe. Uh, but that took 50 or 60 years and the setting up of the UN IPCC and the setting up of the Club of Rome, which was set up by Italy's richest man, who was also a friend of David Rockefeller and in Chase Manhattan Bank with him. You know, so all these organizations were set up with a long uh, game goal. And the key thing is they identified climate disaster, global pandemics, global financial crashes, what was the other one? Global macro terrorism fears. They were the four primary opportunities in order to persuade the little people that they needed a global government. So they identified yeah. global issues. It, it's it's amazing. It's you really cannot overstate, I were just how sociopathic. These people are talk about a god complex. I mean, this is—it's one thing to have sort of a paternalistic view of the world that you are sort of the you know, the benevolent dictator. These people really go way beyond that. Rockefeller went way beyond that. He really believed that he should that they were smarter than everybody else and should be controlling the world. That they had the right to control the world. And I think they identified those levers that would allow them to control it. It, it, it. It's all about control, right? Because you get people to believe that they need a global government by driving them into either a place of fear or a place of desperation or both. You make people so desperate and or so fearful that they say, oh God, I'll do anything you want if you just make it stop. And if the anything is, tell us what to do, you know, whatever, you, your highness, it doesn't matter. And so if you control the, the food source, you control the you know fuel source, you control education, you control travel, you control you know what people wear. If you once you control all of those things, you have people uh completely under your thumb. So I agree with you. This this started way back. It's fascinating, as you point out, that they didn't necessarily need it delivered to them personally. They were happy for their uh, lineage, their uh, their children, or you know their their those who they had tapped as successors to ultimately guide it. But all right, so that's back from the fifties going forward. Now, what started the tipping point? How did we get where we are now? Well, yeah, the tipping point, I think it's it's a long time coming, obviously, since the 50s. And it goes through Kissinger and then the setting up mm -hmm. of the Harvard kind of conferences that was funded by Ford and Rockefeller Foundation. And it turned out later, the CIA. So Rockefeller from the 50s onwards, and you know Kissinger's role, they're up to their neck in the mm -hmm. State Department, the CIA, uh, for good reason, because the CIA have to be highly involved with anything that involves world governance on behalf of the State Department. So it's not a conspiracy theory, it just makes sense. But all of this was moving on and steadily growing towards the ultimate outcome. Now, the COVID was just the perfect kind of scam in order to rapidly accelerate progress. So they'd made a certain amount of progress with climate, They'd made other progress with swine flu. They got pretty close to getting a worldwide hysteria. And then it collapsed because the press around the world was still too free. 
I think I heard that 300 different news outlets all over the globe together began to question swine flu and realized that nothing was really going on. And the whole thing collapsed in a mess. Now, since swine flu 2009, they identified that weakness, the free press. And when it came to COVID 2020, that problem was completely fixed. And that's yes. why we saw all of the press, all of the media, like mm -hmm. gushing about the deaths, terrified, apparently, though they were all caught at parties. All the senior journalists were caught at parties during the lockdown, but they knew what to say. And their CEOs are all members of the World Economic Forum, and they all know what the story is. And an interesting thing is 2006, Rand Corporation, the military industrial complex outfit, did a, a risks report looking forward to 2020s. And they basically called out that the biggest risk they thought that might happen or could happen was possibly a global pandemic. And they noted that what would need to be done and what would happen, and Rockefeller Lockstep Scenario 2010, all published, they're an absolute facsimile of what happened. And what these reports, huge reports and scenarios said, was the governments would have to stamp down with authoritarianism to control the people and control this 2006 Rand report, control misinformation, because misinformation would be the big problem. Apparently, according to Rand and the WEF, who did they did the report for in 2006, misinformation. People think that only that nonsense only came up in 2020 to stop correct people questioning what the hell was going on. So they called it misinformation. But no, 2006, it was all laid out in the RAND report. So they basically identified all of the weaknesses that would undermine the scams of the future. And uh, they worked on them for over a decade before COVID hit. So when COVID hit, I often explain to people, the World Economic Forum since 1993 have uh, indoctrinated 4,000 young global leaders. So Bill Gates and a bunch of other reprobates were the first crew in in 93. And then the Prime Minister of Ireland was in many years ago, Trudeau, Ardern, Macron, yada, 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 4,000 young global leaders. And over those 30 years, they were all helped get, move up the ladder really fast because of the enormous influence of WEF. So they got all these people in place and all of them did actual exercises over the last 10 or 15 years on like 2020 and beyond sustainable development, pandemics. They all did the whiteboarding about how they as leaders would deal with these problems, right? So they were fully indoctrinated. So right. just to finish on that, Kelly, what happened when COVID came? It was like Pavlov's dogs or that Manchurian candidate. Basically, all these leaders around the world and all the CEOs of the media, they all looked and said, ah, this is what we were all scenario right. planning for. Here it is. And they stepped right into a role. Exactly. That's why it was and so coordinated. Absolutely. And so before we get further into the weeds, which I want to about the WEF and these 4,000 global leaders, it's really important to point out that even with all of those leaders, 4,000 of them, they would never have been able to get the traction they did if it were not for the fact that they'd identified the weakness in having an open and independent media. They knew they had to shut that down. This could never have happened. I submit to you that you know, just like it happened with swine flu, the COVID debacle couldn't have happened. Disease X, you know, monkey pox, swine, you know, avian flu, the next fear flag. There, none of those things would get any traction if you had an independent and honest press and an independent and honest social media platform. It was only because they were very successful. Uh, and I'd like your take on that too, how they managed to be so successful in shutting down the the public voices you know the shutting down this quote misinformation and disinformation because without that 
even, you know, 4,000 strong, you know, 40,000 strong, I don't think they would have been able to get the traction that they did. It was by shutting down true, honest, open discourse. Absolutely. And that's, it's a two-hander, I always say, and it's, they learn from Stalin, they learn from the little mm -hmm. guy in Germany in the 30s. They know history and they learn from it and they're bristling with psychologists. So they were well prepared, but they knew the media. I, I think it was attributed to Goebbels, uh, give me control of the media or the radio in those days and I will turn any nation into a nation of pigs. And that was the yeah. contempt. Goebbels knew it. If you own the media, no matter what era or what the nature of it is, you basically have the people because you just mm -hmm. keep telling them the same lie again and again. And after a while, they just, they'll just they just assume it's true. And then they'll turn against people who question it because they'll feel that they're betraying the tribe or they're not saving granny. I mean, mm -hmm. it's worked for all of human history. So that's that. But the other thing is the WEF, the young global leaders are just the tip of the iceberg. So right. they also have the Young Global Shapers community, which is, I think, 50 or 60,000 people. And they're influencers in social media and, you know, all these kinds of spaces. So they've also got a huge program there. And you can only become a Young Global Shaper if you're personally vouched for by another shaper or you're already a member of the World Economic Forum. So they made sure no moles got in there. But then you've got... All of the big corporations, especially big tech and especially all the banks, are all trustees, members, and on the board and heavily funding the WEF. All mm -hmm. the media are in there as well. So all of their CEOs are doing round trips to Davos for many, many years talking about these scenarios and what would be important. So again, when the time comes, they will set the editorial tone in their organizations. And a reporter that questions it will quickly find himself or herself at the end of a contract. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be a chilling effect and other reporters will see, oh my God. And they'll, they'll just note with nothing written, they'll just know what not to talk about. Right. So this is right. not as difficult as people might think. How could they all be coordinated? Well, 50 years and endless money and control uh, can get you these results actually quite easily. Remarkable. All right. Well, we're going to cut to it. We're going to cut to a break. When we come back, we'll continue with this and put up the uh, the diagram that you can walk us through, so that people can start to see just just how uh, intricate this entire this entire scheme is. So we'll cut to a break. And we'll be back in a minute. You could spend thousands of dollars and dozens of hours trying to look a few years younger, or you can skip all that and the hassle and go with what works, GenuCell Skin Care. GenuCell is the secret to better skin. Their products are made in the USA using a proprietary technology that combines a naturally effective base with non-GMO ingredients. In fact, you might have witnessed the astonishing effects of GenuCell during a recent unplanned moment of our show. When just a little GenuCell XV restored my skin within minutes right before your eyes. That is how fast these products work. I know I'm a snob about the products I use on my face. Everybody knows it. Every time I go to the dermatologist's office, they're just rows and rows of different creams. Retinols, vitamin C cream, under eye cream, night creams. Scrubs. And then when I get to the counter, they're overpriced. All kinds of products that you can all find at GenuCell.com. Susan and I love GenuCell so much, we've created our own bundle so you can try our favorite anti-wrinkle creams, correcting serums, under eye treatments, Say goodbye to those fine lines, forehead wrinkles, skin redness, even those dark under eye bags. Women and men of all skin types, GenuCell has got you covered. Order right now at GenuCell.com slash Drew to save 50%, actually over 50%, and you'll get a free luxury spa box plus free shipping. That is GenuCell.com slash Drew, G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash D-R-E-W. We all know the value of a good night's sleep. We feel better, look better, have more energy to spare, but you could be missing out on all of those benefits if you're sleeping on sheets that are too hot or too cold or just plain uncomfortable. I have the solution. 
Cozy Earth Bedding. Cozy Earth is the softest and most comfortable sheets, blankets, loungewear, and more. They use premium viscose from highly sustainable bamboo, and we sleep in them regularly. I wear their t-shirts. Susan wears their pajamas. Cozy Earth Bedding comes with a 100-night sleep trial, which means you have up to 100 nights to sleep on them, wash them, try them out. If you're not in love, just return them within 100 days for a full refund. Susan and I love them. In fact, we have Cozy Earth sheets on our bed right now, and they made a huge difference in our sleep. If you've never tried Cozy Earth, we have some awesome news. You can save up to 35% off Cozy Earth right now. But hurry, this offer will not last. Go to CozyEarth.com, enter my promo code DREW at checkout for up to 35% off on your first order. That is CozyEarth.com, promo code DREW, C-O-Z-Y-E-A-R-T-H, CozyEarth.com, code D-R-E-W. You asked for it, and the wellness company has delivered. The medical emergency kit, replete with ivermectin, prescription antibiotics, and more, continues to fly off the shelves. We keep one here at home. And there are three new kits you need to know about, and more are coming. The Contagion Emergency Kit was inspired by the high demand for the medical kits. In that Contagion Kit, you'll find ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, antibiotics, budesonide, and a nebulizer. And a must for your next trip is the Travel Emergency Kit, something I made sure exactly what I give my patients is in this kit and some more. The kit includes remedies for jet lag, variety of infections, even GI ailments. Imagine your flight getting grounded anywhere, say even in the U.S., and you start getting sick. You do not want to be at the mercy of the U.S. healthcare system or any healthcare system. At home, we keep the ultimate first aid kit on hand. It has over 20 essential supplies and medications for situations when time is of the essence. Order one for your car and your go bag. Because these kits contain prescriptions, your purchase includes a telemedicine consultation as well as an instruction manual. Go to doctor.com slash TWC for 10% off. That is drdrew.com slash TWC for 10% off all your orders. I'm very excited about these kits. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC. There's nothing in medicine that doesn't boil down to a risk-benefit calculation. It is the mandate of public health to consider the impact of any particular mitigation scheme on the entire population. This is uncharted territory, Drew. All right. Well, welcome back. I'm here today with Ivor Cummins, the uh, fat emperor, talking about the global cabal. By that, I mean the World Economic Forum, the WHO, uh, Davos, Bill Gates, uh, and the interconnection between all of them. Uh, COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic was just part of that. Uh, and hopefully Ivor is going to be joining us again to walk through the um, this great diagram he has, uh, complex as it is, but it really does, it's, it's really wonderful because I think Ivor, it, um, it's illustrative of just how deep the tentacles go of this thing. And I think it starts for me to make sense why they've done things like what we, how the whole climate change uh, thing, you know, f- ties in and how the, you know, why it's so important for them to have another avian flu so that they can attack the food system again and why we're killing cattle and all of that, how it all interconnects. So uh, if you're ready to put the, the uh, diagram up, we can, we can do that now, uh, Caleb. There you go. All right. So there it is. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, so all I did really was I went to Dubai. I was invited to give a couple of keynotes at an investment conference, kind of high net worth individuals a few weeks ago. And they wanted me to do the global kind of the great chess game, uh, kind of what we're talking about. And also, you know, resilience against these problems. Uh, So I made this diagram up really quickly, and it really just reflects what's actually happening Uh, But it also reflects the UN 2030, Agenda 2030 goals, uh, pretty faithfully. And it pulls them together. So remember the WEF and the UN, they're basically joined at the hip since Rockefeller largely created both of them. Uh, But they joined up officially in 2019. No media covered it. And the WEF and all its corporations, big tech and banks, will fund the UN Agenda 2030 goals. And they've documented there's an intention for it to become, you know, the new world government in the long run and a new Bretton Woods agreement. And we have CBDCs and all this stuff is being talked about. But this here is just a root cause diagram format, which I've used for 30 years 
using it slightly differently here, but just to see how everything joins up. And you'll see that the red circles, I marked them red, weaken society. This is always a goal. So there's lots of different goals, but they're all synergistic. They uh, reinforce each other, and they all go towards this world government control and power, a centralized system that they want. So if you go to the top left, the COVID-19 program, that's what I call it, because whether the virus was real or not, lab or not, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it was exploited for the horror that we saw occur. And what they got out of that was through MF, mass formation, Professor Matthias Desmet did great work on that. Through these mechanisms, they got lockstep authoritarianism, and that was all predicted and planned by the Rockefeller 2010 lockstep report and the Rand Corporation 2006 I mentioned. So they got this lockstep between governments and that weakened society. But the COVID-19 program itself, if you look at the arrow coming across, weakened society by definition, by getting every, everyone into a mass formation uh, like headless chickens. That's a huge society weakener and dividing people against each other. COVID-19 also gave a transfer of power in the kind of brown or orange there, and it supported the creation of, or the enhancement of the biosecurity state. And the WHO was given enormous powers. No one cared about it before, but now suddenly, if you said anything against them, you'd be taken off YouTube. The CEO of YouTube said that in March 2020. If you conflict with WHO, you'll be taken down. And then if we look a little lower below COVID-19, partner profiteering, and this is a really big parallel benefit of the likes of the COVID program. All your partners get to wet their beaks. The mask manufacturers, big tech, big box stores, Amazon, all the funding partners of the WEF, big pharma, obviously, in a big way, they all get to wet their beak, just like any organized crime setup. And that enhances the funding they can give to the WEF, and it bolsters the corporate alliances with all these corporates who are feeding at the trough. Um, and then censorship. So, so, that's, so let me just interject here. So that's where the, the partner profiteering is where big pharma in your model works into this whole thing. That's the, you know, it, which is a huge piece of this. So big pharma is just one of the multiple partners. As we know, there are people who made billions of dollars on this. And as everyone, you know, many people in China did because that's where all of these drugs and, and supplies came from. But the, and then there was our own US based pharmaceutical companies. So th that comes in under the partner profiteering. Absolutely, Kelly. And people should think of the mafia analogy, organized crime, mm -hmm. and the phrase wetting their beak. Because if a big mafia family is coming in, it creates alliances with all the other families and makes sure everyone wets their beak. It cements alliances and keeps everyone going in the same direction. So that's where profiteering is important. It's the grease that oils this kind of infernal machine. But mm -hmm. censorship apparatus then, it was a huge opportunity to, uh, the phrase I made up was, make censorship great again. <laughs> because for 50 <laughs> years, you know, we haven't had censorship. I mean, mm -hmm. the Western principles are you do not censor. But they mm -hmm. managed in 12 months to make people largely right. accept censorship. So that was another massive benefit going forward to get censorship and the state uh, overriding the First Amendment by using big tech to censor who they wanted censored. This was a huge benefit and that weakened society like nothing else, as we know. Mm -hmm. So that's the mm -hmm. COVID, the whole COVID thing. Now, another big thing I didn't show there was they want a global digital ID. That's why in mid-2019, Rockefeller and Microsoft and Gates set up Common Pass. And that was kind of a sleeper company. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it exploded in February, March 2020. And the Google searches for Common Pass shot through the roof. And they were centered mm -hmm. in East Coast America and Geneva. So you can just look wow. and see right. the data, right? Right. All right. Okay. Yeah. So that's the that's the upper so that's the upper left quadrant of your of your diagram. Mm -hmm. Let's walk us through the next portion of it. 
Okay, we'll just quickly do the gender because this throws people. They say, look, I know something crazy is going on because this mm-hmm. doesn't really feel like grassroots. And yet again, we see all the politicians and all the media supporting something that's anti-scientific, but they're all doing it. So I smell a, I smell a rat. Well, you're absolutely right. The reason for that, and it's been funded by the Pritzkers and billionaires and corporates for decades, and they've infiltrated academia and driven these ideas for a long time. Well, now they're getting a payoff because these things, this nonsense erodes fundamental truths and that weakens society. So society depends on kind of certainties and things you can depend on, like up and down, black and white, male and female. So by they've actually gone after one fundamental principle that society all understands and are actually trying to turn it on its head. And that has caused massive division. You saw J.K. Rowling. You see all these great people trying to call this madness out. You see great professors of sociology and of medicine trying to call it out. What happens? They all get smashed. They get canceled. They get attacked. So this is causing an enormous division in society and weakening society. So that's how all the gender nonsense fits in, even though without seeing the overall picture, you'd wonder, well, how does that fit in with COVID and pharma? Well, it fits in beautifully, actually. Well, it's not coincidence, uh, Ivor, that President Biden announced that this past, you know, our Easter Sunday was a transgender day of visibility. Uh, the holiest of all holidays for the Christian faith. And uh, he announced it instead of calling it Easter, that it was Transgender Day of Visibility. Um, talk about eroding into the very fabric, the psyche, the uh, really the just the, the entire structure of our society is being undermined by that. Uh, and it's very, very divisive. So uh, regardless of whether or not you, you how you feel about transgenderism, the, the fact that he would do such a thing, I think, was not just coincidence. I think it was very, very purposeful to pick Easter Sunday. Yeah, absolutely. It's divide and conquer, oldest thing in in human history, and it's just a a new corporate kind of woke mm-hmm. version. But it's the same trick, same old ploy. Yeah. So. Top right, I mean, I don't need to go through climate. We've had the film released recently. It's superb. Climate, the movie. Uh, I helped share it wherever I could. Professors to the hilt all the way through it, actually smilingly uh, debunking most of the climate catastrophe nonsense. I mean, they don't even have to try. Uh, Beautiful film, really good one to share. But climate, of course, partner profiteering, wetting the beak. The corporates with the green agenda, you've got all the windmills, you've got all the electric cars, a lot of players are wetting their beaks, massive government money, creating more inflation, going into these highly inefficient models. But a lot of people are feeding at the trough. Uh, The industries are becoming massive. WEF said it could be a $40 trillion business over the next 10 years. So they're dog whistling to all the corporate partners. Hey, you can feed guys, you can wet your beak. You know, you see how it all links together and wealth transfer, massive. Let me ask you a question because I know you're gonna be, you're in the upper right with climate change and in the lower left is about the war on farmers. You know, the globalists, part of their their global initiative, they will tell you that, you know, they want us to decrease our reliance, say on animal sources for food. So then they launch a scare, you know, where you've got a bird flu and they're killing, you know, dozens of birds, millions of birds or millions of cows or whatever it is. They will tell you that they they want us to decrease our reliance on fossil fuels. So they create this climate change, you know, thing, scare and say, if we don't decrease our reliance, you know, we're all going to burn up and the the entire world's going to explode and, you know, we're all going to die kind of thing. Do you think fundamentally at the root of this, do they really want us to decrease our reliance on animal sources? Do they really want us to decrease our reliance on fossil fuels? Or are they simply using these as control mechanisms to do what you're saying? Do you think they give a rat's ass about the, the you know, the, about the, the uh, globe, about the 
environment or anything else. I mean, these are this is not Bobby Kennedy saying this stuff. This is Bill Gates. Do they actually care about these things or is it purely a control mechanism and a money making mechanism for them? Yeah, I'd say, Kelly, at the top, the people are important because they have vast legions of useful idiots, including many of our ministers in Ireland and, and all over the world. So don't get me wrong. There's huge numbers of useful idiots who've been well rewarded and activist groups and entrained into this uh, to act as kind of henchmen. And a lot of them may believe it uh, because a lot mm -hmm. of them are mm -hmm. indeed idiots. Uh, but mm -hmm. the guys at the top couldn't give a fig, I would say, yeah. overwhelmingly know that it's absolute nonsense. Now, I would believe that they they get excited at the idea that the people would be denied their healthy ancestral mm -hmm. animal products that keeps them healthy and slim mm -hmm. and more mm -hmm. critical thinking. I'd say that delights them. And I'd say it horrifies them that in the last few decades, Ordinary, simple workers can go twice a year to a sunny holiday on a jet burning their kerosene. So I'd say they, <laughs> they view this as mm -hmm. these, these ants need to be put back in an ant farm, like where they were mm -hmm. for most of human history. This thing right. has gotten completely out of hand. We are the elites. We are the great financiers and bankers. And we're looking at a planet where all of these pesky ants are using up all the stuff and they're having lifestyles that are kind of similar to ours in a way that <laughs> is not acceptable to them. So that's mm -hmm. my personal belief, Kelly, is they certainly have a massive superiority complex or you mentioned the God complex and they're all now together in the clubs. Club of Rome, mm -hmm. Trilateral Commission, Rockefeller Brothers, WHO, WEF. I could go on all day long. All of the clubs are there and they're all together and they're all stroking each other as to mm -hmm. that the fact that they're the elite and they want to run a properly managed ant farm. That is their <laughs> ultimate goal. That's the only way I can put it to be slightly humorous and to call it what it is. No, I, I, I think you're right. It's, look, it's sounding more and more like, like we are living the Hunger Games. We just don't know it or we haven't realized it yet. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, maybe I should be called Katniss. I think, <laughs> I think, I think uh, this is well, more and more the, the Hunger Games. Well, you know what? I, again, I don't think they actually want a kind of a, a depopulation that involves major events because that's dangerous and that could provoke the ants, right, into a bit of a storm. So I think depopulation, which is a popular one talked about, that'll mm -hmm. be achieved by making a world where no one wants to have children. And they're already halfway yeah. there, yeah. to be quite honest. Interesting. And after a few generations, you know, you'll get your depopulation over time. They're not mm -hmm. in a panic. And I don't think they want to hunger games because in reality, they want people to kind of accept this. You will own nothing and be happy. They want right. the masses to kind of walk into their own cages. They don't mm -hmm. want to force them into their cages and starve them because that's dangerous to the elite. So, you know, they want to coerce them into this ant farm, just like COVID was mostly coercion and not mm -hmm. a huge amount of army brought in and railway trucks, right? Yeah. People didn't disappear in their thousands mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. camps. Now, I know there's a little bit of that in Australia. And yeah, they'd like that, but, but they didn't really try that because it wouldn't wash. So they're trying to boil the frog and get everyone drifting into a CBDC, social credit China system, 15-minute right. cities, slowly, slowly catchy monkey boil the frogs steadily, slowly take away their meat and their nutritious foods, replace it with a dependency pipeline of corporate junk food, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. slowly do it. Yeah. No. All right. But, and that's why I said that this all ties into your background in nutrition and chronic disease and all of that, because yeah. I do think that too, they dovetail. Okay. Keep taking us uh, around, the, around the diagram here. 
Right, round the merry-go-round, we're nearly done. So bottom, middle, um, the mass migration, it's quite a hot topic. Uh, you get accused of being racist just for having an open <laughs> discussion. But the reality is this is a century-old strategy, and it's all documented. Count Calergli of the Pan-European Union, I think it was 1926, those guys published in this. They wanted a European super state. It wasn't a Western kind of one world government then, it was the Europe. And they identified that if they could bring in mass migration of very different cultures in large amounts and flood the zone, they'd undermine the nationality and sovereignty of all these disparate nations in Europe. Because the big thing that was stopping a pan-European Union was you had red-haired Irish over here with their fiddles and accordions, you had these Nordic Swedes you know, in the Northern Europe with their own customs. And I could go on all day. You can't make a bland, you know, brown blob of the whole of Europe when you have all mm -hmm. these very independent nations that are proud. So what you do is you flood them with an overload of migrants from very different cultures. And ideally, those floods of migrants will maintain their existing culture and not integrate. You don't actually mm -hmm. want integration because mm -hmm. then some nationality creeps back. So you want division and lack of integration and you want overload, flood the zone. Um, so I think we're just seeing in the last few years, people are wondering, why are all our politicians overloading our systems when we've already got a problem and they don't? they seem disingenuous? They don't seem to be reflecting the voters at all. Like in Ireland, we had 76% said the mass migration out of control has to stop. And all the politicians are ignoring a 76%, you know, public poll run by one of the best polling companies in the country. Why are they completely ignoring us? Well, because they're answering to WFUN. That's why. Right. It's, it's very interesting because in this country, you know, we commonly say, and I certainly say that the reason they're allowing, you know, completely unfettered uh, immigration, illegal immigration is to because they're pandering to votes because these these people will vote for Democrat policies. But that yeah. doesn't explain, as you have in your diagram, why it's going on, not just in this country, it's all around the world. It's been over a decade now that the most common boy's name in Paris is Mohammed. Um, you know, th there's been a huge change. You see it certainly in the UK. So I think that your explanation comes far closer to the real explanation for why there's mass migration uh, being allowed. It's not just as we're seeing, you know, yes, in this country, it will assure that we never have a Republican in the Oval Office again, but it does, you know, your explanation comes far closer, I think, to the real, um, the globalist excuse or, or their motivation for allowing this to happen yeah. all across the world. Uh, and then cover that, that lower left, uh, if you would, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Oh, yeah. So education and children, this is going on for decades. People have been pulling their hair out. They can't understand why all the universities seem to have become literally Marxist indoctrination camps. But as Ayn Rand said, uh, communism and fascism are not combatants. Uh, they are essentially two uh, similar thugs fighting over the same turf. And it's all based on the individual being a, a basically a, a slave of the state, a rightless slave of the state. Uh, she had some great quotes, actually. So the idea here is they use Marxism, even though it's an elite-led world government goal, you use the fairy story of Marxism or communist type lingo uh, basically to give the ants or the people a fairy story, a narrative, saving granny, diversion, equality, inclusion. They've discovered that Stalin used the, uh, the motherland. He used it very cleverly with the people to align them behind him, especially when they moved in towards war because the Russians loved their motherland. So he used that nationalism to gain and keep power. Uh, Hitler in Germany used the fatherland, and he used the kind of inherent racism that had built up in Germany uh, through the Weimar Republic. He used that. So they used stories that were actually kind of real, 
but the modern, and this is a terrible shame on the modern people, because the new totalitarians have discovered that the best propaganda they can use uh, is actually nonsense. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That, that their most powerful tool to rally the ants behind your right. cunning plan is actually to feed them nonsensical stuff. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. so far, it's, it's working pretty well. I mean, COVID was absurd, <laughs> right? The trans right. is absurd, you know? R but, right. Yeah. I was going to say, it's amazing what fear, you know, fear is such a uh, powerful uh, cudgel by itself. It was such a powerful way yeah. to, to motivate um, people. Uh, and I, I want to make it full circle because I want, do want to save time to play this little clip of Bill Gates and, and get your take on that. But I want you to do the, the rest of the diagram first. But Bill, Bill Gates, who is the greatest beak wetter of them all, <laughs> <laughs> to ah. use your to use your your term, he he is the consummate beak wetter. Uh, so I want to play that little clip, but uh, I just love this diagram so much. I'm going to have it. I, I might replace my backdrop here uh, with with that diagram because it is so critical in terms of bringing Ivor together all of these what seem to be disparate components. You know, people don't normally think of transgenderism having anything to do with COVID or how does climate change have anything to do with education? You know, how do these, well, they are all really connected uh, and they're connected with this common theme. There is a plan here. Um, and so I want to, you know, know sort of let's come full circle and then also you know, where does it go from here? You know, do you, do you see a, a way off this merry-go-round? Right. Well, yeah, hope. Absolutely. I think people's awareness, I said two and a half years ago in Amsterdam, I began to say in my talks, uh, a positive note at the end, that this can be broken with awareness. Uh, so the two things that people can do, A, spread awareness, and you can't do it with wild-eyed conspiracy theories. Even if you believe in something if it's not documented and published, like everything I'm talking about here, mm -hmm. be very careful trying to convince someone because if they come back at you and you can't show clear evidence documented and reference for what you're saying, that person, you lose them and they'll call you mm -hmm. a conspiracy theorist, whether it's fair or not. So you have to be clever in how you convert people and make them aware. Uh, and the other thing is live the truth. So in other words, use cash as much as possible. Don't be part of the lie. You know, source locally from farmers. Eat more real human food like meat, mm -hmm. fish, eggs, and vegetables. Get stronger. Get resilient. So, so they're the two things you can do. You know, convert people, make awareness, get out there. But I think the good news, Kelly, is there's more awareness than I was expecting around 18 months ago. I was looking, saying, my God, we're in trouble but now mm -hmm. I see it's all to play for. We're on the razor's edge. And I'll just mention financial and CBDC is a huge one. And more and more people are getting aware that that is the final chains to enslave humanity. A CBDC, and I can't overstate this, if they get that, I would have to drop a lot of, of my optimism because that is literally one of the most effective chains you can put on humanity. Right. For all the yeah. human history. And the financial and the CBDC is the universal digital ID, programmable money. And after that, you can stop any revolution before it starts. You can cut right. people off like Trudeau cut off the, uh, the truckers. And it yes. links directly to COVID because one of the big goals of COVID was to wrestle that universal digital ID to the ground in preparation for CBDC and social credit. Now, they didn't quite make it. The vaccine was supposed to get universal digital ID because ultimately the people would have to take it in the end, but it didn't happen. So they missed a big, big win there. From your purview, what, what do you think, um, you know, the likelihood is that, that we can get out from this, that we can avoid going down that road? Uh, all to play for, I really think we're on the razor's edge. They are racing. They are tripping up a bit now. 
the World Health Regulations and the World uh, Pandemic Treaty has mm -hmm. been watered down to being called an accord. And the latest, I got a leak of the latest writing of it, the draft, and they are mm -hmm. weakening the language left, right and center in response to the awakening from countries all around the world and the people awakening. So it's my understanding that the, 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 the British prime minister has come out and said that no way, no how would they follow this? It's my understanding that, that uh, she came out quite strongly and said that they wouldn't, that they would not uh, abdicate control to the WHO. Well, you got to be careful there because as we say in Ireland, they'd say mass, they'll say that and then they'll mm. sign it. But they'll say, yeah. we will not, blah, 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 oh. until they do, yeah. when they've got <laughs> you to sign it. So it's very right. dangerous. They all lie. But certainly Tennessee has just voted, uh, I think, that they will never, I think it's Tennessee, will never accept any, you know, laws or rules from the WHO, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So we need more of that. And they are beginning to trip a little. I mean, the COVID got great gains for them, no question. But also it's awakened a mass of people. So mm -hmm. many have realized mm -hmm. how nonsensical that was. So they're rushing for censorship and hate speech laws because they're feeling the heat now and they want to rush in hate right. speech laws before the people begin to openly challenge them more and the whole thing gets really messy mm -hmm. for them. So I think we're at a good razor's edge all to play for a moment. And the next 12 or 18 months is going to be really interesting, but possibly a big financial crash will be the next big thing to distract the hell out of everyone. And, and I'm worried about that. Yeah, I, I'm worried about that as well, particularly with our upcoming election. It's, you know, it, it's always, it's a very dicey time for us. Talk a little bit, you know, move to that lower left piece about the war on farmers, because I think that that's something that certainly I really worry about with regard to the food source. Um, you know, we keep having these outbreaks, quote unquote, the, you know, every so often of bird flu or of swine flu or of, you know, mad cow disease, something that, that, allows them or motivates them or gives them justification to wipe out massive amounts of our food source. Um, and, and I have great concerns about that, in, as well as the concerns about um, injecting our food source with mRNA or other vaccines that I think are deleterious to people's health. Yeah, I guess. The, the vaccine one, I'm not sure. Most of my vaccine people, if you ingest it into your stomach, through food and trace amounts. I mean, the real problem with the vaccine, I'd say, is the injection past all of your natural defenses. But mm -hmm. that aside, uh, you got to control, ideally, the money supply, the food supply, and the energy. I mean, that's the big mm -hmm. triad. So mm -hmm. we've got climate mm -hmm. for the energy control, and we see that all around right. us all the time, that nonsense. And you've got the money, of course, are pushing to CBDC, and the bankers mm -hmm. are up to the, their neck in the leadership of this whole mess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we've got food. And what you want is the perfect thing for globalists is take away healthy ancestral homo sapiens meat and animal products, because that makes people strong and healthy, and feed them vegetable oils, sugars, and grains. Feed them junk food. And the junk food you're feeding them is an international pipeline that can actually start or stop depending on how naughty the people have been, right? You can see in the long run. Right. Whereas if you encouraged local cattle, pigs, chickens, chickens, yeah, and beef and local vegetables unprocessed, imagine all the countries had their own local production like they used to have. It's going to be very hard to blackmail or put pressure on those countries mm -hmm. and those people mm -hmm. because they can raise a finger, a middle finger, because they'll ultimately have their own kind of food and energy. So what you want to do is take that all away, remove all the infrastructure and replace it with a pipeline that can be, you know, the tap can be tightened or loosened as a control. It's just perfect in every way. Take away the health 
all your pharma buddies can wet their beak with the antihypertensives and statins because you made the people more fat, more sick, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you've made them dependent. And once they're dependent and the farming is gone, you know, it's very hard to rebuild farming. You know, it's an infrastructure. Yeah. It's very hard to rebuild it if you, you suddenly realize you've been duped. Interestingly, I, I live in northern Colorado most of the time, and I have a large greenhouse there. And about 10 years ago, eight or 10 years ago, I got a letter from um, from the state saying that I was required to register my greenhouse and to list what I was growing in it, uh, how much I was growing and how much food source I was. This is on my property that I was required to register my greenhouse and tell them what I was growing and how much uh, produce I was able to get out of that greenhouse. I promptly dropped the uh, inquiry into the garbage can and never filled it out, but I thought, wow, they are trying to find out who's self-sufficient. They are trying to yes. figure out exactly who can get along without them. Because insurgencies never come from the city. They never do. They always come from yeah. rural areas. People in the city, you know, they would, you know, fall apart if the garbage collector didn't come on time and the police didn't show up and the firemen didn't show up. Where those of us who live out in the hinterlands are self-sufficient. Um, and that I was very interesting to me that they were desperate to find out and to start understanding who has independence, food independence. So uh, before we've got, we're, the clock's way down, but Caleb, do we have time to play that little clip of um, Bill Gates so that I can get Divor's yes. feedback on this? Let's play that, just yeah, the short right version. Now. Here we go. Okay. Bill Gates declared vaccines, the best investment I've ever made. Well, there's been over a 20 to one return, over a 20 to one return. So if you just look at the economic benefits, uh, that's a pretty strong number compared to anything else. This is a cognitive dissonant moment which is being imprinted in your brain, just like remember the Great Depression, remember 9-11. Oh Weapons of mass destruction. We are being conditioned to have the excuse for unbelievable acts of tyranny, which will be justified by remember 2020. We're taking things that are you know, genetically modified organisms and we're injecting them in little kids' arms. We just shoot them right into the vein. The foundation has been sued by the governments of some of the poorest and most vulnerable nations for causing serious harm through experimental vaccine programs. Mm. I, uh, it, it's sort of chilly. You, you, you've been incredibly kind to stay this late with us, Ivor, but I'd like, it's late where you are. Um, I'd like to just get your feedback on this and your take on how you know, Bill Gates, really, uh, what role he plays in this entire thing. Yeah, I mean, it's all Billy boy. He, um, <laughs> interestingly, Professor Richard Werner, the inventor of QE1, QE2 concepts, a uh, great guy, I met him a few times, interviewed him. He told me something I wasn't aware of, and I looked it up afterwards. Uh, Bill Gates's father was a big corporate lawyer for the Rockefellers. Mm -hmm. So again, it's just always <laughs> the same. And apparently he was in, I think, Planned Parenthood with the head of IBM. Mm. And he was just raising mm -hmm. an eyebrow and saying, the Bill Gates story itself, you know, Rockefellers would have identified we're going into a computer age. And they could have easily said, hey, Bill Sr., you're a young guy there. He likes computers. So how did Bill get the big contract with IBM out of nowhere when he nicked the software? So you got to look back and question a lot of stuff. I think Bill Gates is the world's ultimate profiteer, zero principles. And after the Supreme Court and that 25 minute movie, I'm not sure who made it, but I just it was sent to me and I shared it. You know, after the Supreme Court knocked him down because he was a megalomaniac and the antitrust mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, that kind of footage of him nodding. You know, in the testimony, like this weird spectrum right. stuff going on. And then he woke up the next morning as one guy quipped or joked. And he woke up after decades of megalomania trying to ruin his partner who had cancer and was out sick. And then he tried to steal the company off him. That was his friend and partner. And all the other stuff he did that ended up in the Supreme Court, 
and he's finally stopped. But what happens next morning? He wakes up and suddenly he cares about black babies in Africa. I mean, you would want to be, I don't know, severely brain injured to possibly right. believe the Bill Gates story. So I think he was largely, doors were open for him. He got into the big money. He wet his beak like no one else. And he's done amazing work for them with digital ID, the, the decade of vaccines, paying off the WHO. And I could go on all day. He's just one of the good old boys up at the top. And he's doing a great job for them. I, I agree with you. I'm not saying that all of this couldn't have happened without him, but he certainly gave it uh, a, a huge help. He was he was he's been the champion of this entire debacle for sure. Um, I'm going to let you go. You've been incredibly kind to be with us. We're going to have to bring you back now to talk about your book and the whole diet and nutrition piece because we didn't get into that at all. And so, oh, we if you'll come back, we will dedicate an entire show to this topic. I think it's. So important. It does dovetail in, as I said several times, to what we're talking about here with regard to control and making people sicker and more reliant on them rather than allowing people to be resilient and self sufficient. Uh, but I, it is the root of chronic disease, clearly, what we are eating. And I would love to just pick your brain on that for a whole show. So we'll reschedule that at another time. In the meantime, thank you for sharing this with us. And as I said, I'm going to make that diagram wallpaper for the back of my uh, my studio uh, here because I love that diagram. Thanks so much, Ivor. Super. Thanks, Kelly. Anytime. Bye now. All right. Talk soon. Cheers. Um, Caleb, thank you for pulling. I'm glad that the studio didn't blow down. Uh, no big <laughs> storm that knocked it out. Well, well done. Uh, you can see the upcoming schedule here. Uh, Matthias Desmond, going to be a great show, I'm sure, um, coming up on the 16th. He is the father of mass formation psychosis. I'm sure that'll be a great conversation. And everybody's favorite, Salty Cracker, as well. You got uh, my friend Tom Renz coming back, attorney Tom Renz, uh, doing great work uh, with multiple lawsuits on this. And then Donald Trump Jr., that'll be great as well. So uh, thanks to everybody and happy that we made it through without a power outage. Cheers. Talk to you soon. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. The parallel economy has empowered us to care for our health, well-being, as well as longevity. Likewise, for us pet parents who now have a place to go when it comes to keeping the family dogs, cats, even horses in the best shape possible. As a dog dad, I'm thrilled to be working with Pet Club 24-7, a company founded by two guys who lost dogs to serious conditions, including cancer. Pet Club 24-7 has an incredible array of products, including a line of supplements for humans, such as the Inforce Plus Corollius Versicolor and Inforce Corollius Versicolor with Reishi. My friend and colleague, Christina Ferrari, a cancer survivor herself, swears by it. When I was diagnosed, the doctor in the emergency room told me, you have two years to live. Oh, boy. Along with the stem cell, I took these. I have been in remission for eight years now. For dogs, mush puppy treats are a fan favorite. Rex, you want to, oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> he came right. Oh, there he is. They are also made with the Coriolis Versicolor Mushroom, 
which supports their immune system, according to hundreds of clinical studies. Here's Kristen Ludlow, National Vice President. That strain does matter. We do have the most potent strain, and we also extract it in a proprietary way. And that's why we've been having such wonderful experiences with these products. Mush puppies are made here in the U.S. There are no fillers. It's non-addicting. Your dog can't accidentally overdose. Go to drdrew.com slash pet club 24-7 for a discount off the list price. That is drdrew.com. P-E-T-C-L-U-B 247, Pet Club 247.